1.1 reads, which one of the following is the structural formula of the functional group of the ketones? And we remember that the structural group or the functional group for a ketone is called the carbonyl group, that is the carbon-oxygen double bond. And the difference between a ketone and an aldehyde is that a ketone, that carbonyl group is somewhere in the middle of the carbon chain, which means that there are carbons on either side of that carbonyl bond. And so that means that our correct answer is option C, because that clearly shows that the chain extends in both directions from that carbonyl bond, unlike option A, where there could be a hydrogen attached there, which would imply that that is then an aldehyde. So 1.1, the correct answer is C. 1.2, which of the following formulae represents an alkane? And when we are given the formulae in that form, we are essentially asked to check which of these subscribes to the formula CnH2n plus 2. And from that, we can see that the correct answer there is option C, because there are 14 carbons and 14 times 2, 28 plus 2, 30 hydrogens. So when we are asked for an alkane, we are looking for something that has the formula CnH2n plus 2. Question 1.3. Consider the organic compound below. The IUPAC name for this compound is, and what we can see here is that the longest carbon chain is four carbons, and therefore this is going to be a butane, is the main chain, so that means it is either A, B, or C. But what we can see is that there are two methyl branches, so it is going to be a dimethyl, and both of those methyl branches are on the second carbon because we number from the side that makes that number as small as possible. So we're looking for 2,2-dimethylbutane. And so our correct answer for option for question 1.3 is once again C. 1.4 reads, activation energy can best be described as the minimum energy required to. And we know that the activation energy is the energy that's required to cause a collision to be effective to give those particles enough energy to overcome the electrostatic forces of repulsion. So the correct answer is option A. And we can see that the other options are incorrect because the molecules will always collide because they are constantly in motion. The molecules will change orientation depending on how they collide. The only thing that can effectively change the orientation is a catalyst. So that is not correct for activation energy. And although the activation energy does increase the kinetic energy of the reactant molecules, it is not the minimum energy required to increase the reactant energy. And so option D is also incorrect. 1.5 reads, which statement is correct for a system in dynamic equilibrium? And the correct answer there is option D the concentration of the reactants and products remains constant. Option A is incorrect because that is the definition for a static equilibrium when the reactants are used up and the reaction stops. Option B, we often make this mistake where we think that it's the forward reaction that's equal to the reverse reaction, where in fact it is the rate of the forward reaction that must equal the reverse reaction, which is why that is incorrect. And option C, we often also confuse the idea that the concentrations must be equal with the idea that the concentrations must be constant. And the correct answer is with constant concentrations, and so C is also incorrect. Question 1.6. Initially, a certain amount of P was placed in an empty container. The hypothetical reaction reaches equilibrium in a closed container according to the following balanced equation. As we can see, the forward reaction here has a negative enthalpy change, which means that the forward reaction is exothermic. At time t, the temperature is increased, which graph below shows best illustrates the resulting changes in the rates of the forward and reverse reactions after the temperature is increased. So we can see that all these graphs start in the same way, where the forward reaction is represented by the dotted line, and it starts out at a high rate and then slowly decreases until the rate of the forward and the rate of the reverse are constant. And that is then at equilibrium until time t. 
Now we know that when the temperature is increased, the initial reaction is going to be that both rates increase, which means that options B, C, and D are all in the correct line because all of them show that both rates increase initially. But then Le Chatelier's principle says that we are going to favor the direction that undoes or tries to oppose the change that was made. So by increasing the temperature, Le Chatelier's principle is going to try to decrease the temperature by favoring the endothermic direction, the endothermic direction being the reverse reaction, which means that the rate of the reverse reaction is going to increase more than the rate of the forward reaction. That only is for a brief period of time until both of them establish or re-establish equilibrium. And so graph B is the correct graph because it correctly shows the initial reaction that increasing temperature increases both rates and the long-term Le Chatelier reaction which shows that the endothermic reaction being the reverse reaction is favored because we are trying to counter the increase in temperature. Question 1.7 reads, reactions 1 and 2 below have equilibrium constant Kc greater than 1. The reactions given there, based on the reactions above, the acids in order of increasing strength are. So the first thing for us to see here is that a Kc value greater than 1 means that our concentration of the products is going to be far greater than the concentration of the reactants, which tells us that each of these acids ionizes completely. So if we identify our acid in this first reaction, H3X is our acid, which makes HCO3 our base. But because we've been told that this ionizes completely or has a Kc value greater than 1, we know that H3S, H3X must be a strong acid, which means that H2X is then the conjugate base, but not only that, it is a weak conjugate base. In our second reaction, and excuse me, the H2CO3 is then our conjugate acid for HCO3. In our second equation, our hydronium is now a, an acid, and once again, because Kc is far greater than 1, it is a strong acid, which makes H2X our base. And then what we can see from that is that the, the water is the conjugate base of hydronium, and that is then a weak conjugate base, and H3X is now once again a conjugate acid of H2X iron. And so what we can see here is we can see that our hydronium must be the strongest acid because in it is the only one that is never a base as well. So for example, our H3X is in equation number one is a strong acid, but in equation number two, it is just a conjugate acid. So that means that our H3O must be our strongest acid, which means that our options are either A, B, or C. The next thing that we need to see is that because we were told that Kc is far greater than 1, that means that H3X is still classified as a strong acid, which makes it a stronger acid than anything else that is present. So then the correct option would then have our second strongest acid as H3X, and at that point we can actually stop because the only option that has those two in the correct order is option B, but then we can explain that H2CO3 would be our third strongest acid because, as we can see here, it has been identified as a conjugate acid. So the correct answer to 1.7 is option B. Question 1.8 reads, consider the cell notation for a galvanic cell below. Which of the following half reactions takes place at the anode of the cell? And the anode of a galvanic cell is going to be the one that has a greater reducing ability. And the greater reducing ability, as read from the table of standard reduction potentials, is that of nickel, which means that nickel is going to undergo oxidation at the anode, which means that we will start out with solid nickel and that will then break apart into nickel ions and two electrons, which means the correct answer to 1.8 is D. 
Question 1.9, which one of the following is applicable to an electrolytic cell? And the correct answer there is D, a battery is used for the cell to function. Option A is incorrect because reduction takes place at the cathode, not the anode. Option B is incorrect because oxidation takes place at the anode, not the cathode. And option C is incorrect because direct current is required for an electrolytic cell. Question 1.10 reads, the flow diagram below shows four stages, A, B, C, and D, in the conversion of sulfur to sulfuric acid. And this we can see comes from the fertilizer industry. At which stage is a catalyst used? And understanding the theory for the production of sulfuric acid in the fertilizer industry would inform us that the correct option or the correct answer is at stage B when sulfur dioxide is converted into sulfur trioxide, a catalyst is required.